Record-breaking heat, this time in Northern Europe. Kivo, a town in Finnish Lapland, reached 33.6 degrees there. And this is a place north of the Arctic Circle. When weather forecasting is a matter of life or death. These brave Dutch resistance fighters were actually risking their lives to send weather observations into the UK. And why it's all about air masses. The tropical maritime air mass is often dull, damp and mild. It actually starts in the tropics or the subtropics. It's Friday the 9th of July and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, the insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. Last week, we reported on the devastating heatwave that gripped western regions of North America and, as conditions persist, other parts of the Northern Hemisphere are also feeling the heat. With the latest, here's Deputy Chief Operational Meteorologist Mark Sidaway. Temperatures have come down from the exceptional values we were seen a week or so back when the Canadian all-time record was broken at Lytton. Temperatures are very much above average, but not quite where they were a week back. Lytton in British Columbia has had a devastating week. Not only did their temperature peak, am I right in saying 49.6 degrees Celsius, what happened after that? Yeah, that's correct. 49.6 Celsius was achieved and that was uh, a new Canadian record, all-time record. The real tragedy was that just a couple of days after that town set that record, it was pretty much devastated by a wildfire. And I think almost 90% of the buildings in the town were completely destroyed. And let's put this in perspective. Lytton in British Columbia gets proper cold winters as well as hot summers. It's not a desert. It's not in an area where you expect these temperatures to occur. And in fact, just to the north of British Columbia, you have Yukon. They hold the record for one of the coldest places across America. Yeah, it, it's it's hard to imagine, you know, in the British Isles, we live on a small island, so we, we don't get the extremes of temperature that you see in continents. Canada, obviously, being part of the North American continent, sees a, a huge range of temperatures. As you say, uh, the record low temperature for Canada was recorded at Snag in Yukon, which is minus 61 degrees Celsius. So when you compare that to the new record, which is pretty much 50 degrees Celsius, that's a vast range of 110 degrees And yeah, it is because it's a continent. It's insulated from the moderating effects of the sea, if you like. So, you know, Lytton sits in a valley between two mountain ranges. And I think that's the reason it can get these extremes in that little location. Let's just cross over water now and come to Europe, where there are heat wave conditions across much of central, eastern and southern Europe at the moment and something called a blocking pattern, which is in fact affecting the UK weather as well. Yeah, just a few hundred miles east across parts of Europe, they're also experiencing extreme heat. And yeah, it is all linked to a blocking pattern in the upper atmosphere. This is when we see large amplitude waves in the upper pattern. So uh, it can draw cold air south, a long way south for this time of year. And it also allows very warm air to be pumped a long way north. And this is why we are seeing these extremes of heat, not just in North America, but across parts of uh, Northern Europe and even parts of uh, Siberia too. So it it is this amplified pattern, which is the driver for all this. If we head a thousand miles northeastwards up to Lapland, that's a very different scenario right now. It is, Claire. Yeah, it's hard to imagine, but they're actually under the influence of tropical air at the moment. This is air that's sort of originated from the Mediterranean. It's tropical maritime air. It's been drawn north across the continent all the way up into the Arctic. And yeah, we have seen some extraordinary temperatures up there in recent days. Kivo, a town in Finnish Lapland, saw its warmest temperature in over 100 years on Sunday. It reached 33.6 degrees there. And this is a place north of the Arctic Circle. And then similarly, uh, just across the border in Norway, 34 degrees was recorded, which was within a degree and a half of the all-time Norwegian record. And, you know, these are in towns that are north of the Arctic Circle. So it really is quite extraordinary once again. Mark Sidaway, thank you very much. From the Spanish Armada to the refuelling of jet fighters, weather has always played a key role in the planning and potential outcome of military conflict. During World War II, Allied forecasters relied on observations taken behind enemy lines, a risky and potentially life-threatening activity for those involved. New research by the National Meteorological Archive 
has confirmed the observations work of Dutch resistance agents. And, as archivist Catherine Ross explains, evidence was discovered in the most unlikely of places. In the National Meteorological Archive, we have an awful lot of different types of historical record. And one of the things we've got is a huge series of synoptic charts. So those are a snapshot of the weather at a particular time of day um, in the year. And we have those all the way through the 20th century and all the way through the Second World War. The charts of the Second World War are quite interesting because although we were at war with Germany at the time, you can see observations from all across Europe on those charts, which couldn't possibly have been produced by anybody from Britain. Now, we know that one of the ways those observations came in is because the Enigma Code, the German code, had been broken by the British. And so all of their weather observations were being read and plotted onto our charts. But we've long suspected that there might be something else going on, that there might also be observations coming in from other more covert radio sites that might be operated by the resistance. We've been working with the Rijksmuseum and the Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Amsterdam, and they've been able to give us some really, really exciting information, which is that one of those covert radios was hidden behind one of the most famous paintings ever produced, which is Rembrandt's The Night Watch. Now, that painting was normally hung in the Rijksmuseum for everyone to see, but during the war, it and a number of other very important paintings were taken down and hidden in a cave in the Reichskluss vault in the St. Petersburg Marl Caves in Maastricht. And I think probably the Germans knew they were there as well, but everybody wanted to keep them safe. So they were quite happy for those paintings to be rolled up and hidden away in those caves. What the Germans didn't know was that hidden behind the night watch was a covert radio. We do now know that that radio, that radio that was hidden behind the night watch, was also used to provide weather observations to the British in order to assist with Allied aerial operations. And now looking at our synoptic charts, we've been able to find that that radio was broadcasting from what we call Station Circle as a point, point 97. It was actually called Station Marguerite. And that was after the Oxide Daisy, which had become a symbol of the Dutch resistance. And Station Marguerite started broadcasting from round about January 1943. Looking through our charts, it doesn't broadcast every day. It was far too dangerous to do that. If you were caught with a radio, you could be arrested, shot or sent to a concentration camp. But they did send observations at really important times. And we have found some of them right in the run up and the, the hours before and sometimes the days before some of the big bombing raids on Cologne which was quite nearby and it's quite a remarkable thing that you know these brave Dutch resistance fighters were actually risking their lives to send weather observations into the UK when you bear in mind the huge penalties that they could have suffered if they'd been found. Earlier we heard about the air masses currently influencing weather across Europe to explain the different air masses that shape weather here in the UK, here's Ada McGiven. The UK's weather is notoriously fickle. We are surrounded by so many different influences. A large ocean to the west, a continent to the east. Midsummer heat can originate in North Africa and in the winter the north wind doth blow and we shall have snow at least some of the time. Dry air masses come from the south or the east, Africa, Europe, Asia. That's why we call these continental. Moist air masses come from the west or the north. These are known as maritime air masses. Both continental and maritime air masses can be warm or cold. Warm air masses originate from the southwest, the subtropics or the tropics. These are called tropical. Cold air masses come from Canada, Greenland, Siberia, Eastern Europe. These are polar air masses. And when it arrives straight from the north, well, this is called an Arctic maritime air mass. And on returning polar maritime, we have something of a polar tropical blend. Six air masses in total that affect the UK. 
Now, each of these will have their own characteristics when they leave their source region before being modified in various ways on their journey to the UK. Tropical Maritime the tropical maritime air mass is often dull, damp and mild. It actually starts in the tropics or the subtropics where it's warm and humid, but the southwesterlies that bring tropical maritime air to the UK pass over cooler seas en route. When humid air close to the sea cools, it becomes saturated, resulting in thick low cloud, sea fog and drizzle. Even more moisture is wrung out of this air mass over the higher ground in the west. This can lead to persistent rain over western hills, whilst a rain shadow to the east leads to drier and milder weather here. Ada McGiven. And we'll hear more about the other air masses that influence our weather in future episodes. Maritime air masses can dominate UK weather at any time of the year, but how about the next few days? Here with the outlook... Alex Deacon. It's been quite hard to identify air masses this week because the pressure pattern has been so slack, but we've definitely had some maritime influences injecting moisture, providing the showers. And that's how we go into the weekend as well. More showers to come, but not everywhere we'll see them. It's a bit of a mess, to be fair, on Saturday. There'll be outbreaks of rain and a lot of cloud across the south initially, but that should slowly clear although it may not clear the southeast until quite late on. Further north, actually a dry and a bright start for many with some sunshine, but it's here where we'll have the heavy showers come the afternoon. Parts of northern England, maybe north Wales and across Scotland. Now, not everywhere we'll see them, but some big downpours are anticipated. Hail and thunder likely too. Dodging the showers and they'll be slow moving because the winds are light, so many places won't see them at all. And in the sunny spells, it'll feel pleasant enough with temperatures getting into the low 20s. In the south, it'll be a cooler feel because there won't be as much sunshine because it'll stay fairly cloudy, even though the rain should scoot away. Sunday then starts dry and fine for most of the UK, but again, the likelihood of some heavy showers breaking out, particularly in the east, and a weak weather front will bring more cloud and showers into western areas later on. We could see some further very heavy rain across the southeast on Monday. Some uncertainty about that, but there's a strong suggestion now that the weather might just start to settle down as we go through next week. Much drier weather, certainly from midweek onwards, and the return of sunnier days for many of us. Thanks, Alex. Now here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for last week, observed between Monday the 28th of June and Sunday the 4th of July. The highest temperature of the week was 25.3 Celsius at Carlisle in Cumbria on Tuesday. Just one air temperature observation dropped below zero last week. Minus 0.1 Celsius was recorded at Braemar in Aberdeenshire in the early hours of Thursday. As the day length begins to reduce again, the sunniest place was Prestwick in Ayrshire. 15.0 hours was recorded there on Friday. The greatest rainfall totals last week were in the south of England. 55.4 mm was recorded at Plymouth on Sunday. That's just over two inches in imperial measurements. That's it for this edition of Weathersnap. I'm Claire Nazir and editor is Adrian Holloway. Weathersnap is a podcast by the UK Met Office.